All right, everyone. So uh, we're going to go ahead uh, and get started now. It is uh, one o'clock with our show. Uh, so a few quick things, though, before we do get started. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank everyone uh, for joining us here today on uh, Liberty Science Center's Facebook page. Uh, very excited to, to, to be here with you all today. Uh, my name is Andrew Bundes. I'm one of the educators uh, at the Liberty Science Center working in the planetarium. And uh, normally I'd be talking to you from the Jennifer Chalstey Planetarium, but for obvious reasons, we can't be in there today. So instead, I'm talking to you live from my kitchen. Uh, today, we're going to be talking uh, a little bit about what you can look for in your evening sky tonight. So uh, I am in New Jersey uh, right now, and even though it looks cloudy outside right now, uh, later on this evening after sunset, it should be nice and clear. So everything that we look at today, you should be able to go outside uh, tonight and see with your very own eyes. Now, of course, if you do have questions uh, for me, uh, I'll do my best to be uh, reading through the comments while, uh, while I'm talking. So if you have questions, you can leave them in the comments section. Um, I'll try to answer as many as I can during the show. I'll also be hanging, uh, hanging around after the show to answer as many questions uh, there as I can as well. We also do have a couple of, uh, couple of folks uh, from Liberty Science Center who are also in the comment section who are going to be helping me out by answering some, some questions as well. Uh, so yeah, again, we're going to be talking all about the nighttime sky today, and so I guess without further ado, we'll go ahead uh, and give you all a look. So this is uh, what we could expect to see uh, tonight, right around 6 o'clock, uh, as we're facing over toward the southwest. Now this is the part of the sky we're going to be focusing on today, because that's where all of the action is taking place. Now, if you're wondering where exactly Southwest is, the best thing for you to do is to look for the sun. Because the sun tonight is going to be setting almost exactly in the west. So as we watch the sun set right by west, we're going to be uh, taking a look now at our sky as it's going to look at about 8.30 or so in the afternoon. Now, I am seeing a, a lot of comments uh, uh, already about folks joining us from outside of New Jersey, which is wonderful. I do want to mention you should all be able to see about this same thing. As long as, long as, as, long as you are, are in the, the Northern Hemisphere, you'll be able to see pretty much exactly this. The time might be a little bit different, but this is the sky about an hour after the sun has gone down. And there is a lot that we can see in the sky tonight some stars, some constellations, and even a planet. So that's the first thing we're going to be looking for, is a planet. Now, the planet we can see in the sky tonight is the brightest object up there right now. So I'm going to give you all a moment to look around at our uh, simulated night sky here and uh, see if you can find the brightest object that is up in that sky right now, which is going to be the planet that we are looking for. And the planet that we're trying to find is this bright point of light right over here. And it's going to look even brighter in your real sky tonight. Now, not only is this planet really bright, it is also the hottest planet in the solar system. It is the single hottest planet in our entire solar system, which is the beautiful planet Venus. Now, Venus is going to be visible up in our sky here for about the next three to four weeks. By about the middle of May, it'll be gone. But for now, we'll have lots of great chances to see Venus. Now, I did mention that Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, which is because it is surrounded by clouds. Now, even though Venus is not the first planet from the sun, it's the second, it's still kept nice and warm because of its atmosphere. This atmosphere, these clouds, keep Venus at a nice, warm, and toasty 870 degrees Fahrenheit. That is hot enough to melt some metals, which is ridiculously hot. Now, Venus is about the same size as the Earth, but they are very, very different planets. Where the Earth has lots of trees and oceans, water, all that great stuff, Venus has, well, none of that. It is covered in about 1,600 volcanoes. Most of them are inactive, um, but they are still there. And, and, and yes, even though Venus is further from the sun than Mercury, it is even hotter, which is, well, 
just because Venus has that nice thick atmosphere. A planet like Mercury, even though it's closer to the sun, isn't quite as hot just because it doesn't have an atmosphere. The atmosphere of a planet helps to trap heat on the surface. Without one, all that heat just escapes away into space. So Venus is the hottest and also the brightest planet to see in the sky, hanging out right over here toward the west. Now, once you have found Venus, uh, the brightest thing in this half of our sky, there are also lots of constellations, lots of groups of stars we can look for as well. If we look over to the left of our bright planet Venus, there's a very familiar, very famous group of stars right over here, marked most easily by three stars in the shape of a belt right here. Now, if you know the name of this constellation, go ahead, write it in the comments for me. I'm uh, always uh, very curious. It's a constellation marked by these three stars in the belt, a few more stars above it, marking shoulders and the head. We've got some feet, some knees and legs down here. And this is indeed the constellation of Orion the Hunter one of our brightest and easiest constellations to find in the sky, and that's wonderful. Now, Orion in Greek mythology, some of the stories that we tell about Orion is that he was a hunter, and he was a very good hunter. He was able to hunt anything he wanted, but he didn't do it alone. He had help from a couple of his hunting animals. And one of those hunting animals we can find looking for a very bright star kind of behind Orion, over to the left. So if we keep on looking behind Orion, we find another very, very bright star right over here. Now this is uh, the very, very bright star Sirius. Now Sirius is a part of a constellation called Canis Major, the big dog. And it is one of Orion's hunting animals. And these are a couple of our easiest constellations to find in the sky tonight. Now, they are winter constellations, which means as we get further into the spring, they're going to begin to get lower and lower and lower in the sky. And again, in just about a week, maybe two weeks from now, they'll be too low to see. So if you want to find Orion and Canis Major, uh, the next few nights is going to be your best chance to be able to see them. Now, Let's talk about a couple of the stars that we can find here in these constellations. Now, one of them we just mentioned a little bit ago, this bright star Sirius, right over here, very easy to find. But there's another star I wanted to look at over above the belt of Orion, this reddish-orange star right here. Now, this reddish-orange star, uh, I've, I've seen a, a few of you mentioning uh, in, in our comments section already, is different than pretty much any other star that we see in the sky right now. Because it's got this kind of reddish-orange color to it. Now this star has, in my opinion, the best name of any star in the sky. It is Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse is uh, that just very bright reddish-orange star up in the shoulder of Orion. A very, very great star to look for, and uh, well, probably is my... Uh, is my personal favorite star. Now, I want to give you a moment to compare these two stars, to compare Betelgeuse with the star Sirius. I want you to compare, look really closely at these two stars for a moment. Which of those two stars looks brighter, Sirius or Betelgeuse? It turns out that Sirius is quite a bit brighter than Betelgeuse. It's the brightest star in the sky. Now, because Sirius is brighter, we can learn a lot about Sirius. It's an easy star to see. Now, which of those two stars you think might be larger, Sirius or Betelgeuse? Well, we can compare these two stars by moving them very close to us at the same distance away. So here I have put Betelgeuse and Sirius directly next to each other, at the same distance away, so we can compare their sizes. So here, 
this reddish orange star is Betelgeuse. And right next to it, this smaller blue star is Sirius. So Betelgeuse is way, 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 way bigger than Sirius. It's like 400 times bigger than Betelgeuse. Or sorry, 400 times smaller than Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is 400 times bigger than Sirius, even though it doesn't look quite as bright. Now, the brightest star that we ever see in the sky is our sun. Looks very, very bright, even though it's a bit cloudy outside my window right now. The sun, well, given that it's so bright, do you think it's bigger or smaller than Betelgeuse? Well, we can move the sun to the same distance away, compare its size, um, and we will put our sun right next to our good friend Sirius. And, uh, well, yeah. Here's the sun. It turns out the sun is 900 times smaller than Betelgeuse. The sun is 900 times smaller than Betelgeuse, which is really wild to think about. So why does the sun look so bright if it's so much smaller? Well, yeah, it turns out, uh, uh, as, as, as I'm seeing Joan and Peter uh, uh, mentioning in, in our comments here, that the sun is just closer to us, right? A star can look really bright because, well, it's close to us. So when you're looking out at the stars in the sky, if a star looks really bright, keep in mind that it might be because it's really big, like Betelgeuse, or it could just be because it's pretty close to us, like the sun, or like Sirius. So that's something very important to keep in mind. The sun is not a very big star. It's just the one that we live the closest to. Now, I've heard a lot of you in the comments so far talking about Betelgeuse, and I heard, uh, I, I read a few of you mentioning that Betelgeuse might be about to explode. Now, over the past few months, you may have been hearing a little bit more about this star, Betelgeuse. It's been getting fainter. Betelgeuse used to be the 10th brightest star in the sky. Today, it's the 29th brightest star in the sky. So if that's the case, what's going on? Well, it turns out we don't think anymore that Betelgeuse is about to explode and turn into a supernova. But it has been getting fainter. And there's a good, actually two good reasons for that. So Betelgeuse, as we saw, is a really, really big star. I mean, this thing's huge. And a really big star like Betelgeuse has a hard time staying the same size. So over its life, it gets bigger and it gets smaller and bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. When, the, when, the, uh, when Betelgeuse is at its biggest, it looks brighter. But then when it shrinks down and gets smaller, it looks fainter. And this has been happening for millions of years in the life of Betelgeuse. But recently, something else has been causing Betelgeuse to look fainter. And that is the fact that Betelgeuse burps. Yes, Betelgeuse and really big stars like it burp. What happens when a star burps is it sends out a lot of gas and dust away into space, out of the exterior, out of the outside layers of this star. As this happens, the dust kind of blocks our view of Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse, got fainter when it burped and all this dust began to expand away. And now it's getting brighter again because this dust is slowly flying away into space, leading to Betelgeuse once again beginning to look much, much brighter again. Now, Betelgeuse doesn't quite burp in the same way that we do. It's a very complicated process where uh, nuclear fusion going on very, very uh, deep inside of this star can go through changes. It can either speed up or slow down for some reason. That causes shock waves to go throughout the star, and these shock waves can send out gas into space. But uh, I like to refer to that as Betelgeuse burping because it is similar in a lot of ways to how we all burp as well. So that is why Betelgeuse has been getting fainter, because it let out a lot of dust, a lot of gas, and that's slowly fading away now. And Betelgeuse is going to begin to get much, much brighter, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, really, really cool. 
Now, if you are able to keep your eyes on Beetlejuice tonight, remember how bright it looks, and then check it out again in a few months when it's visible in the morning sky, and notice how much brighter it's going to be. Now, one thing I do want to mention that's very important, Beetlejuice is not about to explode today, but it will. Probably not, probably not for another 100,000 years. But when Beetlejuice does explode, it's not going to be dangerous to us on the Earth at all. Beetlejuice is so far away, so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trillions of miles, that is not going to affect us at all. So we don't need to worry about it. In fact, when Beetlejuice does go supernova and explode, it's going to be one of the coolest things that's happened in astronomy. So, uh, but it won't be a danger to us on the Earth at all, I promise. Now, once we have found Betelgeuse and Orion over here, we've found Sirius over here on the left here. So another thing I want you to look for if you go outside tonight, and it's back over near Venus. Oh, actually, uh, I'm hearing a really great question uh, uh, from, from, from Natalie. Does every star have its own planet? Is every star the center of its own solar system? That's a really, really great question. Thank you for asking it. It turns out we think most stars in our galaxy at least have planets around them. Not all of them, but most planets that, uh, that, that we have found in our galaxy we think have planets around them. Not all of them. Some of the some of the planets with star or, or some of the stars with planets around them have just one planet going around them. Some stars we found have had seven planets going around them, or eight, like our own solar system. So lots of stars do have planets uh, going around them. Betelgeuse though does not, uh, at least not that we have found so far. That's a really really great question though, and thank you so much for uh, for all these questions. Ah, so, so uh, Victoria asks, how long is the average star's life? That's another great question. Um, it depends on the size of a star. A really big star like Betelgeuse will only live for about a, maybe 500 million years. Really small stars, though, um, can live for trillions of years. So it all depends on the size of a star. The bigger that a star is, the, the, sh the shorter its life is. The smaller a star is, the longer its life is. So very, very great question. I'd say on average, stars probably live for a few, maybe maybe five to 10 billion years is a good average for, uh, for all types of stars. Now, once we found our good friends Sirius and Betelgeuse, there's one more thing I do want you to keep your eyes out for in the sky tonight, and it is back over by the planet Venus. So if you look down and to the right from Venus, you'll find a little group of seven stars. We call these the Seven Sisters. And they can be kind of hard to see from here on the Earth. So we're going to leave the Earth and go visit them. Now, these Seven Sisters are known as the Pleiades. That's a, just another name for them. And these are seven very hot, very young stars. Now, when I say that a star is young, how old do you think that might be? Like, how old is young for a star? Are we talking like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? It turns out these stars in the Pleiades are about 100 million years old. And that is young for a star. So these stars that make up the Pleiades are each about 100 million years old. But again, that's still young for a star, which is wild to think about. Now, we see the seven stars, but there are really hundreds of them in this group, in this cluster of stars. We see those bright seven, though, just because they're the brightest and the hottest and the easiest ones for us to see. But the Pleiades is a great example of a very, very young group of stars. So if you can find the Pleiades up in your sky tonight, well, now you know, these stars are only 100 million years old. Most of the stars you see in the sky are way, way older than that. So uh, a really, really cool thing to keep your, to keep your, your, your eyes out for as well. Uh, so, so, so Anna has just asked me one of my favorite questions to answer. How many galaxies are there? Now, 
that's a really great question. We don't really know for sure, but we think that there are over two trillion galaxies in the universe. Two trillion of them. It's quite a few. Now, we live in just one. We call it the Milky Way, but that's a really, really great question that I love to answer. Now, we, we've seen the Pleiades, right? Those very hot, blue, young stars. We also saw Betelgeuse, a much bigger, red, a bit of an older star. And every star you see in the sky is a little bit different, right? Some stars are bigger, some are smaller, some are red, some are blue. But every star begins their life in pretty much the same way, including our sun. They begin their lives in what we call stellar nurseries. And one of these stellar nurseries is located right beneath the belt of Orion. Now, with your eyes, you can't quite see it. But with a telescope, you can actually see it pretty well. And we're going to move ourselves now a little bit closer to this uh, star-forming nebula, toward the Orion Nebula, and see what it's like. So, the Orion Nebula is really just a giant cloud of gas. Like, it's really, really, really big. It's uh, big enough to give birth to hundreds of stars. Now, uh, I, now, I did mention a few, or I did notice a few of you asking how the sun and how our solar system formed. Well, it turns out the sun formed in a cloud of gas a lot like the Orion Nebula. Now, every star, including the sun, begins its life in pretty much the same way, as a little chunk of this cloud of gas. Let's say this chunk of gas over here on the left. Over time, this cloud of gas is going to begin to kind of pull itself together and get smaller and smaller. Gravity is causing it to get smaller. As that happens, the cloud of gas starts to get hotter and 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 hotter until eventually it reaches a temperature so hot that nuclear fusion begins. That's what powers a star and then a star is born. We're, we need, need to get to millions of degrees Fahrenheit to, to uh, start fusion. Now, that's how a star is born. Well, what about the planets? Well, if there is enough gas and dust left around after a star is born, oh, that can continue to shrink down even more and form into planets. And this right here, that I'm circling with my mouse right in the center here, is a great example of a newly forming solar system. This is what ours would have looked like about 7 billion years ago, when the Earth and the Sun were just beginning to form together, about 7, uh, 6 or so billion years ago. Now, this is just one place where this happens. This is just one of hundreds, thousands of places in our galaxy where, uh, where this happens. Now, now, the solar system wasn't born from exactly this cloud of gas, but one just like it, a very, 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 very long time ago, which is uh, just pretty cool. Now, uh, I did see someone asking uh, how many stars there are in our Milky Way, in our galaxy. There's about 200 billion of them, 200 billion. And all of those stars began their lives in about the same way, in a cloud of gas, just like what we are seeing right here, which is pretty spectacular. Now, as we move back to our uh, evening sky here in just a moment, when you step outside tonight and looking at our uh, simulated sky here, I want you to keep in mind that every one of these stars that's out in the sky began its life as a cloud of gas or as a part of a cloud of gas. It is, uh, it is pretty incredible. Now, to answer a few questions that I have been seeing so far. Um, so, when is Betelgeuse going to turn into a supernova or into a black hole? That's a really, really great question. So, when is that going to happen to Betelgeuse? Well, we think not for about another probably 100,000 years at least, maybe longer. In fact, it's really hard to know when that's going to happen. We don't really know when Betelgeuse is going to explode. It's hard to say. But we think it'll probably be at least a few, uh, at least 100,000 years, maybe maybe even more than that, which is, uh, which is really, really cool. 
Now, those are most of the things that I wanted to show you all in our sky tonight. So just as a quick recap here for everyone, in case you joined us a little bit late, the big bright things for you to keep a lookout for in our sky tonight is the planet Venus. That's the brightest, the easiest thing to see at about 8.30, about an hour after the sun goes down here in the western part of the sky. So Venus is going to be the brightest thing that you can look for. Down and to the right from Venus, we find the Pleiades star cluster, home to those very hot young stars, about 100 million years old. Over, to, over toward the south, to the left a little bit, we find the star Betelgeuse, a part of the constellation Orion the Hunter. Over to the left of Orion, we then find Sirius, which is a part of the constellation Canis Major. Now, I think, anyway, last I checked the weather from here in New Jersey, anyway, it's going to be nice and clear tonight. So if you have a chance, please, please do uh, go outside, staying safe, uh, making sure to stay safe, and take a look at these beautiful things in, uh, in our sky tonight. If you can't go outside tonight, though, this will all be visible in about the same spot for about the next week. But having shown you all of this now, that is uh, most of what I wanted to show you today, so uh, I am going to now go ahead uh, and answer any questions. So, so if you have any questions that have not been answered yet, uh, you can go ahead uh, and and, uh, and 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 type those uh, and type those into the into the comments, and I'll see how many of them I can answer. So to answer uh, Miguel's question, are we going to see any more planets? It's a great question. So in the evening sky, all we can see right now for planets is Venus. Now, if you were to stay up uh, or wake up really early in the morning, tomorrow morning, at about like 5.30 or so, you'll be able to see Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, and, and my colleague Krista did a really great presentation on those three morning planets last week. Um, so if you check out our Facebook page in the video section, there is, you should, should be able to find uh, another video where we talk more about the morning planets. Okay, so so I, I'm I'm hearing a couple other questions. What is a black hole? Well, I'm really glad you asked me that question. Um, in short, a black hole uh, is a really, 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 really dense part of space. That means we've taken a lot of stuff. We're talking like at least four times the mass of the sun and crammed it together. So it's a very dense source of gravity. And if you want to hear more about black holes, we are going to be talking even more about them. I'll be back here next week, next Thursday at 1 o'clock, uh, uh, talking ab all about black holes. So I'll, I'll hopefully be able to answer more of your black holes questions uh, next week as well, which is, uh, which is really, really great. Let's see... So a question from Alexander, how small is the smallest star? Now that is a really, really great question. And to be honest with you, we really don't know because really small stars are hard to find. But we think that the smallest stars in the universe are just a few times larger than Jupiter. And Jupiter itself is, uh, is so big that we could fit the Earth inside of it over, over 1,300 times. So even a really small star is still huge. So, um, but it's really hard to know how small the smallest star is because we have a hard time seeing really small, uh, uh, really, really faint things. Let's see. Let's see. So... Uh, uh, so, so Reagan asks if I can share the name of the largest star. So the largest star that we have found so far is named U.Y. Scooty. Yes, U.Y. Scooty. That is its real name. Uh, uh, it is uh, even larger than Betelgeuse. It's uh, almost 2,000 times the size of our own sun, if I remember correctly. I could have that number wrong but I think it's about 2,000 times the size of our own sun. So it's really, really big. But that star is named U.Y. Scooty, which is, again, a really, really great name. 
Okay, so so Jen asks, what is Neptune? So Neptune is one of our eight planets, and it is the furthest planet from the sun. Now Neptune is uh, is an ice giant, which means that uh, most of its mass is is made of ice. Um, the rest of it is mostly gas. But Neptune is a planet. It is the furthest planet from the sun. Really, 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 really cold. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I'm seeing a few of you mentioning that you don't want to wake up too early in the morning to be able to see uh, th those morning time planets, which I completely understand. Uh, 5.30 is very, very early. You're in luck. If you wait another few months, uh, around like August, September or so, uh, uh, Jupiter and Saturn at least will be visible in the evening skies. So you won't need to wake up quite so early. Instead, you, you'll just stay up. Uh, you'll, you'll just stay up uh, uh, a little bit later. Which is, uh, which is really, really cool. So Peter asks, do we have to worry about strange matter? It's a really, really great question. Um, so short answer is, is no. Um, strange matter, um, it's a few different things that we call, uh, that we call strange matter. Sometimes uh, antimatter is called strange matter, but there isn't much of that around. There's really none of that around anymore. Uh, so strange matter is nothing that we need, that we need to worry about. Ah, so so Kathleen asks, could more planets form in our solar system in our lifetime? That's a really great question, um, and we don't think so. We don't think that's going to happen. Um, because there's really nothing left to form planets out of. All the gas and dust that went into forming our eight planets has been used up. So we don't think that there is really a chance for new planets to, uh, to form. Now, we could maybe find um, a, a new dwarf planet. We could reclassify something as a, as a dwarf planet. So we're still finding more things. But... There's not there's not much of a chance for a new planet to form just because there just because there there isn't much uh, left in the solar system for star or for planets to uh, to to actually form out of. Now there are more planets being formed in places like the Orion Nebula. There are more planets being formed there, but that's way 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 far away outside of our solar system, which is uh, which is uh, really really great. Let's see. So how much? So uh, Rosemary asks, how much force does a star need to explode with to create a black hole? Uh, it's a good question. I don't. I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. How much force there needs to be? Um, but I can say, for a star to form a black hole, it needs to be at least fifteen times the mass of our own sun. About ten to fifteen. So a star needs to be really, really big to be able to form, uh, be able to form uh, into a black hole. So yeah, there is, uh, there is a lot. Uh, uh, there's a lot that echoes into forming a black hole, but it's, it does take a really, 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 really big star. Ah, so are there any green stars? That is a really great question. Uh, no, we don't think that, that there are any uh, green stars, at least not in the way that our eyes see green. Um, that's mostly just because uh, the material that, that makes up stars, um, when it glows, it just doesn't happen to glow green. Stars are mostly made up of uh, hydrogen and helium, um, and when those get really hot, they don't, they don't glow green. But they can glow blue, and they can glow orange and red and white. But there are, uh, not that we have seen any green stars, though I would uh, really, really like to see a green star. Uh, I, I hope they're out there, but uh, as far as we know, uh, we, um, uh, we have not found any green stars out there. Okay. Ah, so Charlie wants to know if there is a planet nine. So is there a planet nine? That's a great question, uh, and thank you for asking it. Uh, maybe, maybe. So right now, we have eight planets in our solar system, eight of them. Um, we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. 
So those are the eight planets that we know of. Now, some scientists, some astronomers have found evidence that there might be a ninth planet uh, even further away. So we call that planet nine. Now, we, if it's out there, they, some astronomers think it might be, um, it's hard to find because it's really far away. Um, it's, if it's out there, it's at least uh, a thousand or 10,000 times uh, further from the sun than the earth is. So it's very far away from us and uh, will be really hard to see. Um, Cause it, I mean, it, it would be billions and billions of miles away. Um, so it'd be hard to see, but we do think it's possible that, that there is a ninth planet out there in the solar system. So uh, uh, Ingrid asked, what is the smallest planet? So the smallest planet is the first planet from the sun that uh, is planet Mercury. So that is the smallest planet in our solar system. Let's see. So uh, Angela wants to know if planets appear in the same parts of the sky at the same time of night year to year. That's a really, really wonderful question. Um, so, so they do not, um, because the planets themselves are orbiting around the sun. So uh, we can see a planet in, in the sky only when it lines up in, uh, in, in the right way w with the Earth's orbit. But because all the planets are orbiting around the sun uh, at their own rates, at their own speeds, they don't come back at, uh, at the same part in the sky at the same time every year. Um, so uh, that's what makes looking for planets in the sky really fun, because every time you find a planet in the sky, it's in a different spot than it would have been uh, in the year before. Now, the stars and the constellations, they do appear in the same places uh, at the same time every single year. So the stars and constellations are, uh, are, uh, are very, very uh, easy to keep track of because Orion at the same time next year will be in the same spot. But the planets kind of move around a little bit more than that. But that's a really, really great question. So what's the, what's the best time of the year to view the night sky? Well, that's a great question. It uh, really depends on what you want to look for. Um, I think every time of the year is a great time to view the night sky. Um, but I, I really like the winter um, and the early spring. So right around now is a great time to look at the sky because you can find some very, very bright constellations like Orion and Canis Major, uh, which we saw today. So there's some very bright, interesting stars in the winter and early spring. Um, but every time you look at the night sky, you'll see something a little bit different. So, um, so yeah, but I personally, I like the winter. I love to go outside uh, uh, in, the, in the winter, grab a blanket, cup of coffee, cup of hot chocolate, stay warm. It's really great. So Regina wants to know, can stars affect planets? That's a, that's a really good question. So can stars affect planets? So yes, they can. Um, in a few different ways. The biggest way that a star affects a planet is by keeping a planet in its orbit. So the sun, for example, um, is exerting gravity. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's gravitational force is, uh, is pulling on all the planets in our solar system and they're keeping them in an orbit. So they're keeping them in an orbit around them. Now, the other stars in the sky that we're seeing right now are so far away from us that they aren't really affecting uh, the planets in our solar system very much. Um, but yeah, all, all uh, stars do affect planets by, uh, by making them orbit, by making the planets orbit the stars. It's a really, really great question. Let's see. So, so Richard wants to know how many Earths can fit inside of Betelgeuse? That's a really good question. I do not know. So how many Earths can fit inside of Betelgeuse? Let me, let me see if I can do some math in my head real quick uh, and, uh, and I can see if I get back to you. I can tell you though, it's definitely more than a million. Um, way, way more than a million. We're talking hundreds of millions of, of Earths could fit inside of Betelgeuse, at least. But I'll see if I can do some math in my head and get an exact, uh, exact answer for it. It's a really, really good question, though. Let's see. 
So Cameron wants to know if we still have satellites going into space to take videos of the stars and planets. That's a really good question, Cameron, so thank you for asking it. Uh, yes, so NASA and other agencies around the world are always looking for new ways to study space. So we're sending new spacecraft to visit planets all the time, like all the time. Um, and in fact, this July, um, NASA is planning to launch a new rover that's going to travel to Mars. Uh, it's called the Perseverance rover, and it should hopefully be launching this July. Um, we're also hoping to launch an, a, a new space telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope. That's probably going to be launching uh, hopefully within the next few years. Um, but we're always trying to launch new satellites, new telescopes, new spacecraft to help us understand space a little bit better. Let's see. Let's see. So Raquel wants to know how many stars are there in the universe? Um, I, I cannot give you an exact number, but I will give you a little bit of a math problem to estimate that number. So there are about two trillion galaxies in the universe. Okay, about two trillion. It's a big number. Um, every galaxy is made up of lots of stars. So every galaxy is made up of, we'll say on average, about 10 billion stars. So uh, if we multiply, multiply 2 trillion by 10 billion, that would be about how many stars there are in the universe. And that is a big number that I do not know off the top of my head. So if anyone wants to do that math, uh, 2 trillion times 10 billion, that is about how many stars there are in the universe. So that's a really, really great question. Uh, so... So uh, Anna wants to know how many, or sorry, why is Pluto a planet? Or so why is Pluto not a planet, but Mercury is? Which is a great question, because Mercury and Pluto are both very small. So what is it about Pluto that makes it not a planet anymore? It's a great question. So to be a planet, you need uh, a couple things to be going for you. You need to be big enough to be a sphere. So you have enough, big enough to, to be a ball. Um, and Pluto does that, Mercury does that. Um, but also to be a planet, you need to be the only big thing in your orbit around the sun. So when you look at the Earth, for example, there's nothing else that is within the orbital path of the Earth around the sun that is, that is anywhere near the size of the Earth, except for the moon, which orbits the Earth, so that doesn't count. Um, Pluto, on the other hand, is, um, has a lot of other objects in its orbital path that are about the same size, uh, or, or at least around the same size as Pluto, which means that it unfortunately doesn't qualify as being a planet. Mercury is the only thing in its orbit, so it meets that requirement just fine, which means that Mercury we consider a planet, even though it's not very big, it's still big enough to be a planet, and it's the only big thing that's in its orbital path. So, so, it's, so that is a really, really great question. So Rosanna wants to know, what is the biggest planet? What is the biggest planet? So in our solar system, the biggest planet is Jupiter. The biggest planet is Jupiter. It is so big that we could fit the Earth inside of it about 1,300 times. Now, there are other planets outside of our solar system. Uh, we, uh, we call them exoplanets, and a lot of those planets are even bigger than Jupiter. A lot of those planets are four or five times the size of Jupiter. But the biggest one in our solar system is Jupiter. Ah, so Erica wants to know, will the sun explode? So the sun is never going to explode, not in the way that a star like Betelgeuse will. But what will happen in about... Five billion years from today, the sun will eventually run out of fuel. It won't explode. It'll just uh, get, get really big for a little bit, and then it'll shrink down um, and form what we call a white dwarf. But the sun's never going to completely explode. But again, even that's not going to happen for another five billion years. That is so far from now, we don't need to worry about it at all. 
but that is a uh, really, really great, great question. Let's see. So do Jupiter and Neptune have rings? So yeah, Jupiter and Neptune both do have rings. Saturn has rings, and uh, so does Uranus as well. So uh, there are four planets in our solar system that have rings. Uh, so Yamoto wants to know how many Milky Ways are there in space? It's a really, really good question. So how many Milky Ways are there? Well, the Milky Way is the name of our galaxy. So there's just one of our galaxy out there. But there are in space about two trillion other galaxies, but we give them other names. We don't call them the Milky Way. We call them other galaxies. They've got other names. There's about two trillion of those, which is a really, 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 really big number. There are so many galaxies. Two trillion. It is wild. Let's see. And I, I just want to say I, I love all the questions that so many of you are asking. I love it so much. So what is the furthest NASA has ever gone? Boy, um, if you're talking like people, astronauts, the furthest people I've ever been from the Earth is is the moon. That's about two. Uh, that's about two hundred and fifty thousand miles away. Now, the furthest anything human made has ever been uh, is about thirteen billion miles away. Those are a couple spacecraft named Voyager One and Voyager Two. But there were no people, no living things on the Voyager spacecraft. But they're about thirteen billion miles away today, and they're just getting further away. They're going to keep on going forever, forever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So Angela wants to know, with the universe so big, do I believe there is another planet like ours that can sustain life? And that is uh, a very good question. Um, we don't know. We don't know right now. Um, but if you ask me, um, and based on what I know, I would say there's a very good chance. There's a very good chance that there is another planet out there that can sustain life. There are so many planets in the universe. There are, again, uh, there are literally gazillions of planets in the universe. And so the chances are that one of them is very likely to be like the Earth. Now, will we ever find that planet? It's a different question altogether. Um, but on, on one of these Planetarium Live sessions, I hope to be able to talk to you more about looking for other planets. Um, so, uh, so hopefully we can talk more about that as well uh, during a later week. Let's see. Let's see. So how was the sun created? So the sun was created. Uh, oh, let me actually uh, rewind uh, our an earlier part of our show here real quick. So the sun was created in a big cloud of gas that kind of looks like this right here. The sun used to be a bunch of gas, and that bunch of gas got smaller and smaller and smaller until it got hot enough to become the sun. So the sun uh, came from a big cloud of gas that would have looked a lot like this. Let's see. So... Is Sirius the brightest star that we can see in the nighttime sky? So yes, Sirius is the brightest star we see in we see in the night sky. Um, the North Star um, is not even in the top ten in terms of the stars that 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 you'll be seeing um, tonight. Uh, the North Star is probably about the fifteenth brightest star you can see tonight, something like that, fifteen or twenty. Uh, so Regina wants to know, are, are stars solid, liquid, or gas? So stars are made up of gas, but the gas is so hot that it turns into something called a plasma, which is kind of a different state of matter altogether. But but yeah, stars are uh, stars are made up of gas. At the very center, that gas turns into a plasma. So it's a whole nother state of matter. But that's a very, very great, great question. And thank you so much for all these wonderful questions. I hope I can answer as many of them as I can. So can stars move? So yeah, stars stars can move. That's a great question. Um, stars do move. 
Um, but but relative to uh, uh, how uh, relative to how old humans are, they move very slowly. So um, if you look at our sky tonight, if you were if you uh, could compare that to the sky in like ten thousand years, the stars will have moved, but they move very very slowly. So year to year, um, we don't notice them moving, but they are. But they're, the stars are so far away that it's hard to notice them really moving very much. Let's see, let's see, let's see. So yes, Liam says that the sun is bigger than Jupiter. That is exactly correct. The sun is bigger than Jupiter. It is the biggest thing in our solar system. It's so big that the sun... Uh, has inside of it about 99% of the matter and the mass that makes up the solar system. So the sun is absolutely huge. So the sun is absolutely gigantic. So how many how many planets are there usually in one galaxy? So Rebecca, to answer that question, how many planets are usually in one galaxy? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, it depends on the size uh, of a galaxy. So for our own galaxy, we think there's about 200 billion, so about 200 billion planets in our galaxy. A bigger galaxy will have more planets, um, but on average, we think for every star that exists in the universe, there is one planet. So if a galaxy has like two trillion stars in it, it's probably got about two trillion planets in it. But that that's a really really great question. Hmm. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. So how hot is the sun? So, so, so Nora wants to know, how hot is the sun? Um, depends on what part of the sun that you're talking about. So the outside of the sun uh, is tens of thousands of degrees Fahrenheit, which is really hot. I mean, that's way hotter than any place we find on the Earth. Now, the inside of the sun is over 10 million degrees Fahrenheit. 10 million degrees at the center of the sun. So the sun is ridiculously hot. It is uh, so, so, in, in, it's so, so in, incredibly hot. Let's see. So, uh, Ishan wants to know, are aliens slash UFOs real? Um, that's a really good question. Um, not that we have found so far. Could there be aliens in another galaxy someplace really, 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 really far away? Yeah, there could be, but nothing that we have found so far. Um, so, but thank you for, for that really, really great question. But I mean, there could be aliens in some other place, but we've, we never found them. And they will be so far away that we may never find them if they do exist. So many wonderful questions. I want to answer so many of them. Uh, so Marco wants to know, is there any chance that uh, in the future, planets in our solar system could collide? Um, that's a good question. I'm going to say probably not. It's very, very unlikely. Now, in the early years of the solar system, that happened a lot, actually. Um, in fact, our moon, uh, we believe, was formed when another newly forming planet collided with a newly forming Earth. And then that spiraled off and formed into the moon. But we don't think that any planets will collide uh, in the future in the solar system, just because uh, everything is nice and settled now. Now everything's very stable now. Whereas in, in the early years, uh, things were in the early years of the solar system, things were uh, much, much less stable, much more chaotic. Stuff was flying around. So what is Jupiter made of? Jupiter is made up of gases, um, pretty much entirely gases. Um, a lot of helium, that's the main thing that makes up Jupiter. Or sorry, hydrogen, excuse me. Hydrogen is mostly what makes up Jupiter with a little bit of helium uh, mixed in there as well. Some other gases uh, uh, make up uh, Jupiter as well, but it's mostly hydrogen and helium that make up, that uh, makes up Jupiter. Let's see. Let's see. All right. So I think at this point, uh, uh, I am going to 
uh, uh, need to uh, get going with uh, with our live stream. But I, I had a lot of fun here today. Uh, everyone who asked me a question, thank you so much for uh, for asking me questions. I, of course, love answering questions, so thank you so much. Um, uh, if you're looking for any more activities to do uh, while we are uh, at home, please do visit our website, lsc.org, and check out LSC in the house. We have so many uh, great activities, experiments that you can run uh, that, that, that you can run at home. And I will be back here uh, next Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, I'll be back here next Thursday at 1 p.m. talking all about black holes. So I hope to see uh, hope to see all of you uh, again uh, in a week from today. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you all so much. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. Uh, but have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, a fantastic uh, rest of your day, and stay safe. Thank you all so much.